<laughs> I'm going to take you on a very fast sprint through 50 years and through three projects um, that um, evolved really out of each other. They're cousins. Um, it's really to give you a picture of what the artistic process is like, or really any creative process. I think it's a little different than we sometimes imagine it to be. I'm going to put to you that really a lot of creative work comes out of mistakes and omissions and from iconoclasts. We sometimes think that artists are inspired, um, that they, they seek inspiration somewhere, or that they're looking for something beautiful. I think it's different. I think the process is different. So today actually is a birthday um, in one way. 50 years ago today, I was entering this building uh, with my then husband, Peter Blake, arriving in my uh, Triumph Vitesse convertible to work on a project um, that was this one. Um, you'll probably recognize it even though it's not complete here. And in this picture, I chose it very carefully. There's a mistake, and there's an omission, and there's an iconoclast. The mistake is a little white blobby bit at the bottom. It's a guitar. Um, not that it's a mistake to be a guitar, but later on it was looked at and someone thought that what it said was P-A-U-L question mark, and that meant that Paul was dead. <laughs> He's pretty much alive still, um, we're all glad to say. Um, but the, the idea there was that this, um, this kind of story spread globally, um, it, was, it was a conspiracy theory about Paul. And that was back a while, it wasn't, it wasn't just recently. Um, you can see that some of the letters are missing from the word Beatles. Um, uh, there's, they were put that way so that we could actually get it centered properly. And the iconoclast is me standing on that chair. <laughs> um, this is the um, work that you would be familiar with. Um, I'll draw your attention to a little figure on the right-hand side there. Um, that's a figure of an old lady, and I'm going to come back to her in a minute. Um, you would look at this and probably say it's all there, but it isn't. There's a mistake on the cover. I've not talked about this mistake very often, and I don't think very many people have pointed it out, um, but I'll close in on it a little bit and see if you can see it. English people among you might, grammar people might see it. Got it? It's an apostrophe. Um, Sergeant Pepper should have an apostrophe either between the R or after the S. If his name is Peppers, it would be an apostrophe afterwards. Um, it's actually Pepper, and it should be between the R and the S. That means there is um, a degree of possession there. Um, it's a possessive apostrophe, but sometimes apostrophes stand for something that's missing, something that we, we don't um, actually see in the, in the picture. So, like in can't, it's the O, and it's an apostrophe. Um, here, I'd just like to draw your attention to something that really is missing besides the apostrophe. Joe F. Grave made this cover. He is, uh, was a fairground painter um, and a very, very skilled artist. We paid him 25 um, pounds to do two drum skins front and back. Um, recently, this drum skin sold for over a million dollars. Um, so he missed out there. Um, <laughs> And I don't think he ever signed a disclaimer for the use of his artwork. Um, anyway, I don't know if that's a lawsuit waiting to happen, but it's a very beautiful piece of work. Um, the apostrophe. Um, it's, it's a very useful symbol for what I want to tell you. But before we go down that path, I want to talk about John's mistake. Some of you will know this mistake. Um, John, like the other Beatles, was asked to make a list of the people that they considered to be their heroes. And we got quite a long list from John and another long list from Paul, not much from Ringo. And from George, we got his gurus. Um, and so there was a kind of uneven spread amongst them, but among John's choices was Adolf Hitler. Now you have to know that this cover would no, be no icon whatsoever had we allowed that to go forward. Um, it would be something pretty awful. 
And so Brian Epstein and Peter and myself decided it, it had to go. Um, I think, you know, we need to hold our idols to account. I wouldn't want to suppose what John was thinking, I don't know. Um, but I think it's an important thing to consider that sometimes people, when they're young, make mistakes, or even when they're wiser and older, make mistakes. And mistakes are part of our culture. They're part of our testing. Um, our children are afraid of mistakes. We must teach them not to be, because creative thinking is about being willing to take risks and being willing to test things out, being willing to create a theory, prove it right or wrong, and to be able to roll with those answers. So I'm taking the apostrophe through similar situations when I'm an artist. I'm looking at things that um, maybe are forgotten, that people, people aren't noticing, maybe things that are a mistake, maybe there's something we have to put right, right or put wrong and then look at it. We have to declare these things, we have to study them. And so here we come to 500 best album covers. Now, they um, decided in 2003 that Sgt. Pepper was the number one album of all time. Um, I'm not necessarily standing by that personally. Um, but the fact was that they decided at Rolling Stone that that was the case. This is what one of 500 looks like. Up in that corner in the top is, is Sgt. Pepper. And in this mix here, of course, there's some outstanding work. I'm coming back to the actual cover itself because I'm going to go from mistakes to omissions. And in 2003, I sat down and I thought, I'm going to do some math here. I want to look at what is on this cover. So I took a piece of paper and a pencil, and I sat down and I thought, OK, how many African Americans are on the cover? How many Americans? How many women? How many LGBT? How many people of other countries are here? How many scientists? And I went through these things, and I, I invite you to do that. And it, the statistics are not good. Um, I felt there were a lot of holes in the cover. Um, principal among them, we could say the African-American community contributed to the base that we would call the, le the whole work of the, the Beatles. I mean, the jazz and rock and roll and rhythm and blues were their food, and yet they cited no uh, African-American sources for their music. Um, Sonny Liston is there, but he's a boxer, and he's there because Peter loved that sculpture in Madame Tussauds. So, the Beatles chose no women on their lists whatsoever. So Peter and I put the only women in that are there, and our choices have to be called into question too. Half of them are fictional characters, three pinup girls, two window um, mannequin heads that are to hold up hats, and um, my grandmother. So... <laughs> And then, and then Mae West, she was a good choice, she was mine. <laughs> and uh, Diana Doors and uh, Marlena Dittrich. Um, so it's a pretty pathetic list, I think, um, and uh, time that that was addressed. I then decided that this was a gateway. This was something I needed to talk to my friends about and see if we couldn't do something about that and make uh, a mural, perhaps, in Salt Lake City. And so I got together with Janet Wolf and Eric Dodd from Spy Hop and Global Artways, and we sat down and we tried to figure some things out. Um, very kindly, John Williams um, of Gastronomy donated this wall to us, and it was a big wall, and we knew we could make a really big mural here. We did a survey on um, uh, KRCL, I think, and at West High, we did uh, the art fair and got a whole bunch of um, names for a list of people that we might like to do. I was thinking it was all going to be Britney Spears, but the list we got was fantastic. I mean, people were citing the most interesting people. They were citing people who were catalysts for change. They weren't talking about celebrity. They were talking about people who made social change, scientific inventions, um, a, an amazing array of people. And so we started in on the mural. With a little help from my friends, we got it going. <laughs> and um, this is uh, the original crew. Um, in fact, we had 33 people work on it, most of them non-artists. Um, and we worked on it between uh, September 24th, my father's birthday, who was called Ted, um, and uh, um, uh, November 19th. And 
on November 19th, I stood in front of the mural that completed, and I thought how far we had come since 1967. I was very cheered by that. It was 2004, and the political situations were pretty dire at that point. Um, but we had really advanced some of the principles and ideas that really should have been present, I think, in the 60s. We all think about the 60s as being a very revolutionary time. It, it had its conservatism, too. And I think that, really, the period between the 60s and the new um, century really are a time of great activism and wonderful advances. Um, I'm going back to 62 for just a split second here to introduce you to the grandmother. My intention here was to make something wonderful of an old face. I felt that women in 1962, particularly older women, were left out. They were furniture. Her body is a chair. Her front legs are the front legs of the chair. Um, her face I wanted to do as a quilt, and I thought if I brought color into the wrinkles that it would be very wonderful and very kind and very beautiful. People looked at it and said, it's macabre, I think it comes from psycho. Um, <laughs> it didn't work in the way I thought it would, but it was something of a concern to me and still is. Um, in 2008, I had an exhibition and I wanted to do a comic strip. Um, in the comic strip, I wanted to talk about um, how women were perhaps left out of the um, museums, how the women artists weren't so well represented in galleries and so forth. And so here I did this uh, comic strip where the mannequins who've escaped from shop windows are parading a, in front of a piece of street art. And the street art is of women uh, from different walks of life, but all um, women who have achieved things. So we're thinking about catalysts here. Um, I had to do some research. I didn't know my history. And with that idea, I thought it's time for another mural. Um, well, that mural took about eight years to get into being. And um, in 2016, I took the idea to Diane Stewart, and she said, let's do it. And this is the result. This is um, seven panels, the first kind of edition of the mural. Um, you'll see a reproduction outside in the foyer. Um, they're each four foot by uh, eight foot. The mural is 28 foot long in this uh, uh, session here, and then we added two more at BYU, so it's now 36 feet long. Um, these women are really something that cannot be turned into an omission. They need to be heard. They need to be listened to for what they did and how they thought and what accomplishments they made. They've, some of them, been almost utterly erased from history. We don't want that to happen. Um, we want to be able to see those faces and include them in the narrative, the historical narrative that we're all a part of. All of us women stand on their shoulders. All of us who have accomplishments owe them a debt. And we need to put them back into our story. Um, they achieved their scientific discoveries, their forward thinking, their social changes. Um, against all the odds, they persisted. They persisted against, you know, terrible difficulties, and I think at this point um, it's something that we need to consider very carefully about how we pay homage to these women and put them in our future as well as our present. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.